everybody. Good evening again, everybody. Welcome to the last session of the 2014 Hip Hop Literacies Conference. Um, we are so thrilled, 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 thrilled to end this conference with a wonderful conversation between first two matches absolutely inspired me and are so important to this field of work that we've all been talking about over the last two days. And it's truly our pleasure to have them here and to close this um, with a conversation. To my immediate right, we have Dr. Brittany Cooper, professor, assistant professor of women's and gender studies and Africana studies at Rutgers University, and the co-founder of the Crunk Feminist Collective. Yeah. A contributor to everything. Um, <laughs> Voice Everywhere is one of the leading you know, black women scholars in the country, and I'm so thrilled that she's agreed to have a conversation with our other state panelist, who is to my fault right, Joe Morgan. <laughs> Author, cultural critic, Susan Minty, Dr. Morgan. <laughs> Obviously, for us, the point of so many of us, the point of the term for hip hop feminism in a groundbreaking book with chicken heads. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, all right. Um, and we wanted to have this conversation in the conference. One, we noticed we were talking on the phone one day, actually, um, for the pleasure of this, I also need to work with each other, but they're also my sisters, my friends. Um, and wanted to honor the fact that. Chicken Heads came out 15 years ago. And as we notice over the course of the conference today and over the work that we do that so much of us do, um, it continues to resonate as though that book was written today and has a kind of power and presence um, that we only hope to have for a lot of us as scholars and workers, but work that lasts and sustains that is timeless but so timely in terms of what it can do and what it continues to do for us. And to bridge that in the conversation with someone who does so much work that is in that space as well, it's about feminism, it's about generation feminism, the manifesto that was published by the Conference of Collective, and the work that they do in terms of responding to and engaging, and truly existing in that great, complicated, messy, dynamic area of feminism in our generation. So this is going to be really a conversation between just two people who just want it, who are bringing wreck, who are bringing brilliance, who are bringing a flawless way of thinking about a lot of good flaw things. They will look like this too. So um, it is my pleasure and honor to get this started, and we will have time for questions and everything as you enjoy your food. And we just hope for this to just flow and to really be a vision of a space in the space of So thank you. Yeah, we can speak pretty loudly, but can you guys hear us if we talk like my check one, two, one, two? You can hear me? All right. All right. Excellent. Um, so what I want to do is actually begin by reading a little bit of the Hip Hop Generation yeah, Feminist Manifesto that was our very first post at the Crunk Feminist Collective blog because it explicitly seeks to link the work that we aim to do there with the kind of space that Joan created um, in When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost. We are hip hop generation feminist. We unapologetically refer to ourselves as feminists because we believe that gender and its construction through a white patriarchal capitalist power structure fundamentally shapes our lives and life possibilities as women of color across a range of sexual identities. We are members of the hip hop generation because we came of age in one of the decades, the 1990s, that can be considered post-soul and post-civil rights. Our political realities have been profoundly shaped by a systematic rollback of the gains of the civil rights era with regard to affirmative action policies, reproductive justice policies, the massive deindustrialization of urban areas, the rise and ravages of the drug economy within urban, semi-urban, and rural communities of color, 
and the full-scale assault on women's lives through the AIDS epidemic. We have come of age in the era that has witnessed a past and present assault on our identities as women of color, one that harkens back to earlier assault on our virtue and value during enslavement and imperialism. Our era has likewise been marked by an insidious reimagining of earlier forms of violence to include the proliferation of stereotypes, both from the public sphere and from our communities, which have now named us welfare queens, quota queens, baby mamas, hoochies, gold diggers, wifeys, bitches, hoes, and tricks, along with a range of uncreative rhetorical <coughs> permutations. We identify with hip hop because the music, the culture, the fashion, and the figures provide the soundtrack to our girlhood and our young womanhood. Our coming of age happened in the linguistically and rhetorically rich cultural milieu and transformation that was the 1990s, the decade of the woman, but also the decade of the female MC, Queen Latifah, MC Light, mm -hmm. The Rat, Left Eye, and TLC, Foxy Brown, Lil' Kim, and Lauryn Hill. We not only jammed to New Jack Swing, we reveled in the beats of New Jill Swing, too, because we understood what Queen meant when she sang, in a 90s kind of world, I'm glad I got my girls. We witnessed Puffy invent the remix, Mary J. Blige pioneered hip hop soul as she looked for a real love, and FUBU start a global black fashion trend that was for us, by us. We were captured by Darius and Nina falling in love, breaking up and falling in love again, even as we observed that the art of Boys in the Hood and Jason's lyric imitated a side of life and death seen too often in our communities. We grew to the sounds of the G-Funk era and wept at the murders of Tupac Shakur and the notorious B.I.G. We are hip hop's middle children. Folks who fell in love with hip hop at the tail end of the golden age, came of age during the modern era, and find ourselves increasingly concerned with the gender and race politics of hip hop in the industrial era. We unapologetically blend the terms hip hop and feminism like our hip hop feminist big sister, Joan Morgan did more than a decade ago when she invited us to quote, fill in the breaks, provide the remixes, and rework the chorus. So we call ourselves hip hop generation feminists because while many of us appreciate the culture and the music, we do not have a blind allegiance to it, nor is our feminism solely or in many cases even primarily defined by hip hop. Yet our connections to hip hop link us to a set of generational concerns and a community of women locally, nationally, and globally. So earlier, um, you know, I was talking with Joan, and and this question emerged for me. Um, when you created this this concept, this formulation, this frame, this analytic, all these things that hip hop feminism has come to mean for us, has it become in these fifteen years what you imagined or hoped it would be? Um, you guys can hear me, right? I don't have to use it. So I should, I, before I answer that, Brittany, I should say um, what probably most people in this room don't know is when I first read that the Kronk Feminist um, Manifesto went up and there was this thing and I, I read it and I was home and I broke down into tears. Um, and not like a little tear up well, but like a ugly cry, like a... <laughs> Um, because you, you know, you, you sit in your house and you write this thing called a book and you have what I now know as a grad student is a theory or an intervention and it makes complete sense to you, right? Um, but you, you really don't know what the impact of that will be on the world. And honestly, I wrote Chicken Heads to be the swan song. I was like, I'm going to write about my connection to hip hop and my connection to feminism one time, and then I'm not talking about this anymore. <laughs> so that was delusional. Um, and part of, the, part of the reason I felt that I wasn't going to talk about it anymore is because I wanted to have that swan song be an opening and a voice for a generation of women who would be coming behind me, who I felt would be much more capable of having this conversation um, basically because I wanted chicken heads to give them permission to have it. Um, and I, I, I felt for a very long time that I had to keep doing the work because that hadn't quite happened. 
Um, it was happening, but I wasn't in a position where I felt like I really don't need to talk about this anymore. As in, someone can call me up and say, can you do this talk on hip hop and feminine? I'm like, I could, but why don't you call this person or why don't you get that person? I, I wanted to be able to just refer it out, right? And know that the work was going to be done uh, not just competently, but better than I could do it at this point. And when I read the Crunk, um, the Crunk Feminist Manifesto, I went, Jesus, it's, it's time. Like, I really felt like I could take that hat off and switch up the dissertation <laughs> project. And they're like, OK, we're good. Hip hop feminist, it's good. It's in good hands. Um, and so in some ways, it did more than I ever could have imagined. Um, I never imagined that people would, I would meet people and they would say, I'm doing my dissertation on hip hop feminism, particularly since I wrote the book strictly not to be used in academic spaces. Um, because I felt like while I got a lot from uh, the feminism that I was introduced to in college, I felt that it existed very much in the space of an ivory tower. And all of the work that I was doing in a very real way on hip hop journalism was you know, this was not distant work. Like, I was truly in clubs, <laughs> you know, in a boys' club, hands on with artists till like three o'clock in the morning doing dumb shit, like that kind of thing. Um, I just, I wanted to speak from the cultural space and not an academic space. And so the book is really written like at the time everybody was reading Terry McMillan. I was like, how long does it take people to get through a Terry McMillan um, novel if they're really into it? I was like, three days? You gotta be able to read Chicken Heads in three days if you want. Mm -hmm. I want you to curl up with it like that. Um, and so for it to become Occupy, you know, a space in academia was very weird. Um, but I really, really feel like this is the moment where what I wanted to do was produce an understanding of feminism that made sense for a generation of young women who came up on hip hop culture with all of its beauty and all of its contradictions um, that deliberately placed its lens of interrogation in a space that was gray and messy. Um, like, you know, that line, like, I need a feminism brave enough to fuck with the grays. Um, and so I feel like hip hop feminism does that, mm -hmm. and so now I can go be Greg someplace else. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's but you know, but hip hop is a really different kind of thing than it was even at the end of the 20th century, right? I mean, we're the second decade of the 21st century, and so it's a really different project. So you can sort of make this argument about you know, hip hop can help us win, and I listen to a lot of stuff, and I don't feel like I'm winning. winning. You know. Um, and I, so I wonder about, so in like at CMC for us it's, it's like, well how can we set this up as a set of resources that help us to resist? Like, because you know that y'all are like, you know, we're bobbing our heads to the beats, and then you listen to the words, and you're like, oh my god, I have to stop right now, you know what I mean? Um, and so, how, so I, I mean, can it still help us win? Um, I think it is helping us win, because, um, you know, in 1999 or 1980, whatever, to say to someone, I'm, I'm going to do a book on hip hop, like you, people didn't think you could be uh, as into hip hop as I was, right? Or, or, yeah, as I was, I won't say as I am, and be a feminist. Like those two things, people just could not imagine them together. Mostly because, one, they couldn't imagine young black women embracing feminism. Um, and two, they just couldn't imagine a feminism that was messy. Mm -hmm. I think we've come to a point where we understand that feminism can be messy, almost as like, of course feminism can be messy, right? right. right? There are those of us that are not comfortable with the fact that it's messy, but we understand that like our lives are complicated. And so I think grayness is something that we accept as part of something that has to be worked through to get nuanced answers. In that sense, I believe we're winning. So when I understand that hip hop is the thing that brought me to that place, I absolutely think that hip hop, hip -hop can help us win. Do I think I feel like I'm winning when I, like, I try to listen a little way? No, <laughs> I don't. But for me, this never, for, me, for me, this has never been about, um, you know, the, the intervention was a temporal one in many ways. It was about 
what does it mean to be try, try and embrace hip hop as a young black woman at this particular time in the pervasiveness of hip hop culture and still love the music right. and still need, feel the need to critique the music, but really do it from a place of love, really do it from an understanding of, and not just a love of hip hop, but a love of black people, a, a love of community, um, a love that just didn't feel that black men were dispensable, um, a feminism that had to reach them also, because it needs to make us like all better. Mm -hmm. um, what did that mean and still have to really work through uh, the messiness of hip hop culture? So sometimes people make the mistake of feeling like hip hop feminism is only about studying lyrics or making commentary on artists or feeling I'm a hip hop feminist so I can only talk about hip hop in terms of misogyny. Um, I came to hip hop long before I came to feminism. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up literally on hip hop's like left breast. Mm -hmm. Feminism was something I could give or take for a long time. So to me, it was like, I can sign on to this feminism thing, but I'm not giving up like hip hop. Like it's asking me to draw the line between where are you black and where are you a woman. So yeah, I do feel like um, if we look at it in the, if I look at it in the long view, that hip hop helped us win mm -hmm. or is helping us win. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, it's that, the, it's the courage of putting those terms together, right? Hip hop and feminism in a way that people said could never be possible. That made us think about that when we were thinking about what we meant when we said pro feminism, right? So for us, pro feminism was a type of hip hop feminism. It was deeply rooted in the South, and we were sort of living in Atlanta at the time. Um, and, you know, and getting crunk was a way of life. Like, you know, it wasn't just, it was the thing you did at the club, it was getting hyped at the club, but it was also like, you said some racist shit in this class, and so we about to turn it out. Like, we, it's gonna be an issue in this seminar, right? Um, and to us, we thought of that, to use the term percussive, as a way to say, you know, so what I love about, so this is the thing I love about Chick Tech. I have this vivid memory of walking through the new Howard University bookstore, I've never seen the old Howard bookstore. Yeah. So walking through the new Howard University bookstore, and I still have the copy that I bought in the year 2000 as a college student, um, and I was like, what are chicken heads? What now? <laughs> um, you know, and then coming home and like, you know, sort of voraciously reading this book, um, and not having a whole, you know, and, and feeling understood. And, and not even, I don't even know that I took feminism away from your book initially. I think I felt like what you had done was articulate a kind of real black girlhood that I had not ever seen articulated. And, I, and, and what you gave us was permission to say that we don't have it all figured out, right? right? And so I wonder like, what the space of that is in movement building or in our work, right? The sort of tension. Because um, I feel like there's sort of been a moment in feminism where we're really, we want people, we still like, your book, I remember being trained by older scholars who'd be like, you know, there are these problems with this book because she seems to really like patriarchy. And we were like, no, oh, what she said, you know, like, so you would see like all the young women in the room go, what? That's how we got from it, right? Um, and so I wonder about those tensions now and how we're negotiating it when we talk about somebody like Beyonce, right? Because we, because I feel like we still, we don't, I, I'm wondering if we actually do make space or contradiction left. And I feel like that's what your book gave us permission to do. I feel like that's what we try to do at CSC. But I feel like we also still have these tensions in the culture that we're giving up something vital if we acknowledge that we're still struggling. Well, you know, I, I think that what I always say Beyonce is less interesting to me as a feminist as to what she prompts in feminist conversation, right? So she's like this black feminist Rorschach test. Like you look at the, you know what I mean? She's the ink plot and people could be looking at the same thing and they just end up on like absolutely different, which is interesting, is an interesting um, tension. But I do think that one of the things that she challenges speaks to a particular moment where we are, which is a challenge in feminism across the board, but not just black feminism, is this need for homogeneity and this need for um, having the word sisterhood do this work that says we're all the same, we all think the same way, we're all on the same page. How do you constructively work through difference? You know, We have language for um, how we want to understand and recognize difference when we're talking about 
uh, black and white, or we're talking about um, racial differences, right? Or even like ethnic differences in some ways. But when we, when we have to say as women that our points of entries are very, very different, there are class differences, ethnic differences, generational differences, they don't necessarily have to stop but um, mean that at the end of the day, we don't think that patriarchy is a good thing. Right. That we think that you know, se sexism and systems of sex, uh, structures of sexism have to be dismantled. But there's a whole lot under that about how I walk and like breathe and you know, live in the world. Right. And so some of us do that kind of, you know, um, particularly, you know, Rosa always says that she is a radical feminist, right? And her work is particularly about dismantling those structures. I'm a feminist who really feels it's important to, uh, to work and theorize a feminist that, that allows women to figure out how to be in this world, how to exist in a, with the fullness of humanity, even in the face of patriarchy. I, I have to recognize for Rosa and I that we're both feminists, but our projects are very different. And it also means like we're friends, but we're gonna butt heads, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, all right. You can talk about being capitalism all you want to. I'm really happy about how this 12 year old is over here, like getting crunk, you know what I mean? <laughs> and feeling empowered. And those are both necessary conversations. But I think that um, feminism um, in some ways is very comfortable with, still very comfortable with certain kind of binaries. Like it has to be either or. And I, I wanted to ask you because I think the diversity of opinions in the Crunk Feminist Collective really do the work of what I'm talking about. So how do you create that climate amongst yourselves that allow for that, those kinds of highly divergent opinions sometimes? Yeah. Um, I mean, we really talk a lot about what we mean when we say collective. <coughs> so that we're, we don't mean that we all think in the same way. And then we think that part of what it means to get to do the work together is that we have each other as a community that actually play off of, right, to, to share um, to share ideas with and to hold each other accountable. So, um, you know, so that, I mean, look, I mean, my, my blog name is Crocktastic, um, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> and usually, you know, I'm the person that's like, let's go take everybody back, all the time. So if I had my way, you know, you would just see takedown pieces all the time, you know, all the time, right? And so there are other, you know, sort of systems in the collective who are like, you know, what are we trying to build, we see, like, what is, you know, what is our end goal, right? And is this really going to get us, you know, is this really going to help us sort of with the world that we're trying to produce, right? And so we mean crunk as, like, yeah, we'll check you, but we also mean it as, like, a space of generativity. But part of the thing, too, is that we have actual relationships with each other and a certain trust so that we can be accountable, and we fundamentally respect each other, right? Um, respect each other's work and, um, and, and give each other the benefit of the doubt that it doesn't, you know, that even when we disagree that it doesn't always, that it's, it's not in a bad faith ever, right? That it's a real desire to see the world sort of go forth in ways that are fundamentally more just. Um, but also, I think the other thing to say, is sometimes like we talk to each other and we like, Lord, this is sort of like being in a music group. And, you know, we're trying to figure out like, is it going to be like new edition? You know, <laughs> is it going to be like Destiny Child? Like, which model, you know, like somehow we don't want to evolve. Like, we sort of want, like, we want the like new edition and then you can spawn off and have multiple acts and come back together and still put on a great show 15 years from now. Because I hear new edition puts on a great show all like, um, years later. Um, you know, so we sort of joke about that. But, um, yeah, we, um, you know, when we have, you know, when we see each other, um, as resources, and we, you know, and, and we also sort of recognize that at the end of the day, the relationships matter more than the labor matters, right? And that's that's really hard, right? Sometimes is to think so. So it's a, like the CFC is a bunch of badass women, right? All very ambitious, highly educated, really smart, and we essentially said like. We can take the male model, which is all about sort of big up the next superstar dude, right? The, the you know the next second coming of Jesus, right? Which is how we treat you know, which is sort of like our leadership model culturally, right? Or we could say that in the end we don't think that that model is particularly sustainable, and so rather than competing with each other, um, it's you know 
Well, the collective model is sort of more sustainable, so it may mean that you don't have any one superstar rising out of that group, but that what you have is a superstar product all the time, a really good product, and frankly, it's more fun that way. You know, it actually is just more fun to be able to do it in a group of people that you respect and that you know how to do that. And, and, and I think that we spend a lot of time thinking about how hip hop both has gotten this right and has not gotten this right in terms of the models of how they produce work. Um, and, and I think we would say that, that there's a hip hop ethos behind our kind of minimalist, like two turntables and a mic. It's like us and a blog, and we don't have a lot of digital training, so sometimes things look a little interesting. <laughs> but the content is always, you know, pretty solid, right? You know, I I wonder kind of what kind of resources if we're like forming a hip hop feminism for somebody coming in to feminism today. Do you think hip hop feminism is like the best sort of entry point for some, you know, for like a young woman? Could it speak to her own in the same way? at that, Brittany, at least for me, is that hip hop was a viable point of entry, mm -hmm. right? So I also understood that my feminism wouldn't always be rooted in having to talk about hip hop. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's like this moment where people get really upset that Beyonce calls herself a feminist. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, it is very possible that a 14 year old can look at flawless here, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, um, make her way to Chicken Heads, then find her way to Bell Hooks, mm -hmm. and find her way to Patricia Hill Collins. And that's kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's like you embrace the place where people find openings and spaces, um, because the formulation of your feminism is ultimately going to be something very personal, right? So the work that I'm doing now around, the work that we're doing now around, um, so I should say, that one of the most incredible experiences um, for me, speaking at, you know, about the uh, negating that sort of second coming of Jesus model, you know, that dudes kind of do in hip hop, is I, I don't know if people really understand how reciprocal the relationship is and how uh, cross generational, I guess, Jesus, okay. I am, I am, I'm not quite old enough to be their, their mother, but I am, I am older, significantly older. We spend a lot of time talking to, to each other. Um, some, uh, you know, some of those things are about feminism, some of them are about things that should never, ever, ever go on record. But one of the, one of the, one of the things that has been really critical for me is how circular and how beautiful that model is. Because while I might have been their point of entry, when I entered the academy, um, the academy is by nature a really like, you know, I don't do well in structures like, you know, I'm a hip hop feminist. I believe in blowing shit up. Like, so going into this place where I sh absolutely created a book that was meant not to function in that place, then to be like, okay, I'm gonna do this work and I want y'all to give me a PhD. I still had to find a model in that that could work. And my model became this generation of scholars who read my work and embraced feminism, but then I, I turned to them, like, I, this dissertation proposal, y'all, like, what is she really asking me for? I don't really, wanna, like, a lot of the conversations are like that, with a lot of expletives. Um, and to kind of, you know, have them remind me um, why my work matters in the context of academia, which I, I don't always see, because I'm busy trying to blow the model up, and, you know, and understand that the work is situated there for a reason. Um, and so the work, the work, my work becomes enriched in a very different scholarly kind of way because of my consistent engagement with these younger scholars who may have decided like hip hop was their point of entry, but their scholarship is just bad. Like I just, I'm, I'm 
often sitting here, I tweeted as I was listening to Treva's um, presentation, like, I know people say she's like me and Mark Anthony Neal's like intellectual love child, but all I ever want to do is be in Treva's class. I just be sitting there like, why can't I take your class though? You know? Um, and I think that that's one of the ways that a femin that one of the ways that a, a model in feminism works really well when you understand that it's about the reciprocity, um, and not this kind of because I, I I feel like what I had to come up against in many ways was a very stringent kind of keeping of the guard, you know, of older black female feminists who were just like, I don't know what this is, I don't want no parts of it, I don't like the fact that it's in my classroom. If it's gonna be in my classroom, I wanna rip it apart because there's no theory. And I basically wrote it being like, fuck you and your theory. Like that's that's really like I don't like I don't live theory. Like my feminism exists very much like not in a tower but on these streets. So what does that mean? Then having to come to Brittany and go, okay, so this affect theory that I said I wasn't gonna go nowhere near, like that might actually work really well in chapter blah, 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 blah. So I think it does mean this understanding of a fluidity and an openness and um, a model that is really much more circular um, than, I th and than linear, yeah. you know, and it's important. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I use your book many a day in a of conversations in, in my classes, right? Because I think that what, what hip hop feminism, hip hop generation feminism does is give us permission to bring our whole selves to the spaces that we're in. Um, so it, it becomes an invitation to say, I'm not leaving anything at the door, and I'm not going to give you the opportunity to define what this means for me, right? Um, and so, um, so I, what, one of the things that I say to Joan, which is sort of my approach to the academy, is look, you just have to win the arguments, right? Like, you just have to win the arguments. So it's not that you're wrong, it's just read all the shit they tell you, right? And then be like, here are the reasons why those arguments don't work and these arguments work better. And so, you know, for us, and, and that is also like this thing about, so it's so funny, right, that like, the chicken heads book is supposed to be an academic book, because the thing is, I think that one of the things to remember is, it didn't start out for me as an academic text, but when I got to the academy, and I was in a space that didn't speak to who I was fully, then it was the book that I ran to, to make space for myself, right? Um, and we hope that, so we took some of those same kinds of things we think about the CFC is that, you know, because folks, you know, people say, oh, man, she does this, interesting. Uh, but, you know, people will say, well, this is elitist, or it's, you know, or, you know, or how do you deal with the fact that you're academics writing, you know, writing this kind of work? And the thing that we sort of say is, look, we haven't been academics all of our lives. Most of us are first generation. Uh, most of the CFs are first generation academics. I'm a first generation college grad and a first generation. Right? And that's true for my wonder twin, uh, from Fidelity, uh, and some other folks in the collective as well. So we're writing for ourselves, that, you know, so that means that there's a way in which you're in the academy, but not of the academy, right? And you sort of have this foot in the door, but you don't ever feel like you fully fit because you're always thinking about the communities that aren't there, right? And, and you don't have that kind of access, and how do you move among those folks too? So when we write, we're always thinking of them. If a person never gets a step foot in the college classroom, can she come to the CFC and find something that's going to help her think about a situation that she's been going through, right? Um, yeah. So, so that, for me, that's the way we try to take up the ethos, because this thing that you said about, you know, that we don't always have to talk about hip hop. I don't know if we talk about hip hop a whole lot at the law these days at all, right? But, um, but we talk about things in a hip hop sort of way, which is to say it's irreverent, it blows shit up, it says that all kinds of things can exist together in the same space and be productive. And those are hallmarks, I think, of like hip hop epistemology, right? If you had to say that. So, yeah, and I, I, I wanted to just jump on that for a second and talk about the fact that. You know, when I'm talk when I was writing about a hip hop feminism as a I don't know, 28, 29 year old, and I'm now like I'll be 49 this year. So for me, it was also really not so much about the music all the time. It's just like how that particular group of writers that I came up with, like Jeff Chang, um, you know, uh, Kevin Powell, uh, Scott Pulse, and Bryant, like. 
because we were hip hop, we just didn't ask for permission to do things. You had to just do it, you know what I mean? Like, I had never taken a journalism class, but when The Voice was like, you wanna write a, you wanna write a story? I was like, sure, I'll just figure it out. Um, this struck, you know, this, is, this form is not really like how other journalists do their things, but to me it made sense because the writing was very informed also by the rhythm and the music, and so, okay, then it became hip hop journalism. You know what I mean? You, I mean, and I think for this generation, um, it's not so much for me that they become hip hop feminism or even they become like crunk feminists. I want them not to ask permission to do their own intervention and their own formulation. You know, it's like I wrote, um, every generation of feminists is handed a bolt of cloth and it's up to you to cut out the clothes that'll fashion it to your own liking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't want people waiting around for permission to do that. You have to just do it. Right. You know, and my model was a very hip hop one. Like, you don't ask, you just do it. Like, no one is gonna say, hey, can I be like one of the, one of five female journalists, uh, hip hop journalists in the country? Right. No one's gonna allow you to do that. No one gave us that space in hip hop. You had, you had to be like, I have a right to be here. And now y'all got to get used to what that means to have a woman in the locker room. So I think that those things are still really very relevant, yeah. you know? Yeah. I don't think you can ask for permission to claim Beyonce. If you want to claim Beyonce, then claim her, but understand that people are going to challenge you every step of the way. Right. And like you say, then you have to win the argument. <laughs> then you have to figure out, all right, and then you have to be willing to also win the argument and challenge Beyonce at right. the same time. You have to be willing to challenge what you love and call it to the mat and understand that you're doing it from a space of love. Yeah, I mean, you know, our goal is never for anybody to come across feminists. I mean, you know, I said that term to some high school kids a couple days ago and they were like, what, what's wrong? And I was like, oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> I 
mean, I, I definitely, so when I started to do this work, um, first of all, you should know that I went to graduate school saying I was definitely not going to do two things, that my project would not be about hip hop and it would not be about feminism. So one of those things ended up being a bold-faced lie because I'm doing pleasure politics. Um, but I also live my feminism. It's not a thing that just like lives in my head. So um, in a way, I don't know why I was delusional in thinking that I was going to do a project that wasn't about um, feminism. But I did realize that there was a way that like hip hop um, feminism in, in terms of the analytic that I had created still stopped me from getting into pleasure, talking about pleasure the way I want to, even though I think hip hop feminism has always held ero the erotic dead set, you know, like, why doesn't anyone admit that uh, listening to all this in your face testosterone also makes my nipples hard? Like, I think I've always been really honest about that. But what I wanted was a way to talk about women's pleasure that didn't have to go through men or misogyny. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get straight to hard nipples, basically. <laughs> you know? um, but then I realized that there was nothing, <laughs> there was nothing um, in the way that we are taught in black feminist thought that made a space for pleasure as part of the analytic from the very beginning. So even the way that we theorize, we begin to theorize sexuality out of the context of slavery dismisses agency or at least sees it problematic or troubling enough that it will get turned into an argument about black women's um, hypersexualization. And my argument was, and this is also coming as someone who had to really study African American studies because I wasn't born here. Like I'm a, I'm a Caribbean, um, I'm Jamaican born and I consider myself Caribbean American. So African American history was something that Everyone in my household had to like learn, like we had to like pull some books in and really learn. And my question always on some fundamental level was, there's a reason that the African American experience is so inspiring to political liberation to other countries. And part of that to me is that you survived it. And the survival cannot just be about trauma. The survival cannot just be about a people defined by pain. To me, there had to be pleasure, even in the horror of the middle passage, or you simply would not have survived the experience. And so my work on pleasure is really about going back through those spaces in black feminist thought and inserting pleasure back into um, the conversation. What does that change about how we think about black women um, black female sexuality, our relationships with each other, our, our uh, you know, male-female relationships with each other, once we say that pleasure is a legitimate and necessary part of the conversation. Um, and I think that I had started to practice doing that in hip-hop feminism, but I also needed to be able to get past hip-hop to be able to articulate a pleasure politic. And that's definitely been a part of our work at CFC, so we don't write about this much now because one, y'all know some of us, and two, um, uh, you know, and it's also hard writing about love and sex and relationships in a really public venue. Um, and, and so, you know, for us, we've always held sort of at center, like that, you know, there is no revolution, right? No justice, right? No promise uh, without pleasure. That part of what we meant when we said we wanted to hold on to prompt was that there was something about the kind of bodily pleasure of going to the club and shaking your ass that just can't be captured um, for all the academic theorizing that you might do, that we kept on doing it, not because we were sort of steeped in false consciousness or didn't know better or sought to just sort of live in a contradictory way, but because there was actual joy and actual pleasure in the ability to move one's body and be in one's body in particular ways. Um, and we too said, you know, we kind of wanted to defy this this thinking that says that black women can never um, talk about sex. And so, you know, so we really did engage some conversations about sex and relationships and dating um, on the, in the blog space as a way to kind of um, make it clear that we want that to be part of whatever next generation iteration of feminism goes forward, that it's a conversation that we really need to have um, in all the ways we can have it. And so it like spawned one of the things that spawned, like after the competition, our comment section was a Tumblr um, called like the Better Pump Correct Tumblr, which you should check out. It's got good stuff on there. It's not heteronormative, which I you know, so just so you know. Um, so and then the hashtag 
black feminist sex is the best, best sex, sex ever. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so part of our goal was also to have a conversation um, with you guys. So I think this is a good point in the conversation to do that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I feel like everything that y'all are like saying, but I guess like my question is like, I'm in mean, class, I go to a high school, I'm in class with a whole bunch of like white people who necessarily have to struggle and deal without. How do you get them to understand how this is important? Because I feel like they're kind of like the ones that kind of like control our classes. Like if you're a black WGSS, you don't have a voice. Um, you know, I think different people answer that in different ways. Um, I am at this point as an almost 50 year old uh, uh, black feminist who is deeply invested um, in black women, right? I'm really not that, con like, that concerned. Like white people's gay is just, I don't give a shit about it. I don't, I really don't, you don't really factor into my theorizing. I don't really care about making you understand. If you do understand, that's wonderful and that's love. I'm not going to spend three hours making you understand when I could be pushing what I need to say along further for those three hours that I have someone in a class. So um, I think that even in my classroom, that there's a certain understanding about the kind of work that you need to do to catch up in the conversation. So I'm not, as even when I'm teaching, I am not going to present this material as if it is legitimate and deserve, does it deserve to be studied. It isn't a question. You know what I mean? I have sat through, I pretty much went through predominantly white schools my entire life. Um, and I had to sit through a bunch of shit to get out of the door that I just thought was absolutely irrelevant to my life growing up in the South Bronx, but I had to study it. I just think we need that kind of arrogance and that kind of swagger. So I don't necessarily know that for you that the most productive goal is to get them to see, it's to get you to see, and then take it to the community that you want to reach the most. Yeah, I'll her. You know, you're not there to make white folks more comfortable on the one hand. So if you feel like, so this is the other thing I'm saying. If you feel like some shit is not being said, then I, I mean, I was the kid by college and, and then in grad school. Now before that, I was like, out of school, right? You know, so I was in sort of predominantly white schools up until college. Um, and I didn't blow shit up because I was, you know, because it just wasn't the space. Once I had a different set of resources, I was like, oh, hell no, I'm not going to be in a, in a room where you're never talking about me and you're assuming that your experiences are normative. So the thing that you have to balance is um, that sometimes it's appropriate for you to disrupt shit and just be like, this is not, you went, you can talk about you, but be clear that you're not talking about me. At the same time, sometimes there's a cost to that. You have to decide if you want to pay the cost, the sort of exhaustion that happens when white lady tears go for women start crying in the college dresses because <laughs> you know, do you want to do it, right? And so that's the thing that you have to figure out is when is it worth it for your intervention to sort of enter that space because you think it is going to do the kind of work that you need. So like, you know, there was a moment in grad school where we're like reading bell hooks, reading bell hooks, and uh, this is a feminist theory class. All my white colleagues in the class, I'm like, she don't use split notes. Bell hooks is not even split notes. And, you know, she has a PhD, she should know better. And I was like, who mentioned we just <laughs> what? Like, what in the world? And so I just said, I was like, really, we're sitting in class talking about bell hooks and split notes? Like, you don't think that that's a problem? You know, and I just saw like all these people turn red around the table, you know, like, but to me, in that moment it mattered, right? Because I was like, what you're not going to do is malign one of our scholars on some bullshit, right? But, you know, if it's just you sort of making off the cuff remarks that you think are just relevant to everybody, some days I'm just like, you know what, I don't even feel like it today, so I'm going to let you talk and then I'm going to go to the bar afterwards, right? And those are all reasonable kinds of self-care <laughs> interventions and resistance. And you should adopt them all as part of your
interviewing rappers who have like a modern day equivalent. And I wanted you to maybe like, I don't know, tell, give them like context. I think, you know, like they, because I was like, I don't know who she is. And they were like, not really. So I think you should tell them like something that she did so they can relate to it. And then um, my other point was, I think like around five years ago in rap, like the thing like that a lot of dudes were saying is it no longer because like I be fucking vicious. It was like in a fucking yo bitch. Everybody knows this. Like, have you have there been any thought in writing about this? It was so silly to me. Not only can you be getting a lot of success, but nowadays you have to be rapping this like I'm, I'm with your woman and she's cheating with me. So there's like this new dynamic of, of infidelity that's in it. So I just want to know y'all's feelings about that, but also give them some context about what you've done and what this book is about. Because I don't think that they, they really know what the content of this book is. Well, I mean, I think that's actually really normal. The, the, the average age the young reader comes to Chicken Head is about 16, sometimes 15. So I would, I, and I'm also really uncomfortable being like, I was a fella, I just, I'm just not that person. But what I would say is that they're primed for it. So um, I actually think it's less about what I did than if you're looking for a, a, a text that makes sense of how you can like hip hop, what are these questions I have about this feminism thing, is it for me, is it not for me? It's a good book to kind of, make your point of um, entry. You know, I, I will say the work that we do around, um, you know, Mark Anthony Neal spoke earlier. And it's also, I mean, I can't stress enough how important it is to do these work with crew, right? So like, I kind of, just given where I come from, I fundamentally understand, like you roll with a crew. Like, not having a crew is, is a bad, dangerous thing. Um, Mark and I have been friends since we were three years old. Like, we grew up in the same building. He's my first best friend, still the forever BFF. So we, wrote, we, we, we bounce these things off each other a lot, like all the time. Um, he's usually one of my first sounding boards for the work. He feels a little supplanted by the Pleasure Ninjas. I just want you to know there's a little bit of saltiness about that. Um, but a lot of the work that's emerged out of our work on hip hop and feminism has been this deliberate deconstructing of masculinity. And what are the limitations that um, uh, a hip hop sexism and patriarchy, how does it limit the fullness of a man's humanity? If that is the model of masculinity that's being constructed. So I think that why, you know, I think that Mark's um, work earlier on illegible masculinities speaks to just that. What are the ways that we're trained to look at black masculinity in this very narrow way that don't fully capture the humanity and the complexity of who men are? And I actually think that hip hop feminism did that work first, and then feminist black men took it and ran with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. I mean, I don't know that there's been a real shift. I mean, I think what you're talking about is machismo and just sort of, you know, upping the ante. But what's interesting is the ways that black men malign and undermine other black men in the music, which is not a thing we talk about when we're talking about how they're sort of using women as pawns and using women as objects. That is also about sort of tossing shade, you know, because because hip hop doesn't just traffic in terrible narratives about who black women are. In many respects, it traffics in terrible narratives of men living narratives about who black men are as well. Um, and not just in terms of violence, but also in terms of sex and sexual desire. Um, and you know, and even though I don't, I'm not that hot on Jay's politics these days, one of the things I think he says in the COVID that I really rock with is that what he would like to see happen in hip hop in terms of it growing up is for it to reach a certain level of emotional complexity and maturity, right? That there is you know that there's a whole sort of landscape of feelings and emotions that just don't get explored in the music. And he wants, you know, he's like, it's time for us to start talking about how they feel about their relationships or how they feel about violence in their communities or how they feel about struggling to make ends meet and not just a kind of narration of the hustle or a narration of the conference, right? And I think that's actually really important. Yeah. Um, this is for both of you.
I, I identify as a feminist. I don't say I'm a hip hop feminist. I don't, if you're asking me, are you a feminist woman? I identify as a feminist. I don't identify as a womanist. I don't identify as Africana. Fem I don't do it because I feel like it's semantics. And feminism allows me the broad point of entry to engage in multiple conversations. And I don't really want to spend a lot of energy on labels. Hip hop feminism actually really came about as my at part of my own internal process of trying to reconcile my identity as a feminist woman that was writing. Um, and I, I came out as a feminist very publicly in a kind of conflicted way in my journalism. So that part of my process about how I became feminist is very much integrated in as part of the work. Um, but hip hop, I, I was really from outside, I constantly had to justify, how can you be doing this work in hip hop? How can you be writing about hip hop? How can you love hip hop and call yourself a feminist? And Chicken Heads is the answer to that question. I've been puzzled by feminists very specifically, probably above all um, And that's me, no, because I know mainstream feminism, white
Um, so thanks so much, both of you, for the amazing work that you did. I had a, a, a question, because both of you mentioned that you don't really write about hip-hop anymore, but you, you talked about the punk collective. Um, yeah. Sure. So I guess my question was going to be about your decision, not each of your decisions, to write less about hip-hop. Um, though if it's the theoretical framework or your lived experience, the soundtrack to your life, I, I wonder how you all think um, the kind of hip-hop academic community is diminished by, your, by you not contributing to it. So like a, a great example is most people, uh, a lot, I know a lot of women have been inspired by your book, Jim, um, and then um, just like I know a lot of people were inspired by Trisha Rose's book, but until she did Hip Hop Awards, there was like this huge period where she didn't write anything. And so I just wonder how you think about um, your absence from hip hop impact. Um, well, you know, when I, was a, when I was a music journalist, right? So I was like a, oh, okay. How do, how, the question is, how do we feel that um, our decision not to write about hip hop as much um, impacts the overall uh, work that people are trying to do, particularly feminists are trying to do around hip hop and feminism? Um, so I, there are two things, right? So I understood, you know, I was a music journalist first. Before I was a hip hop journalist, I was a music journalist. And I was a black feminist writer. Those are the two things that like people places that people will situate me in terms of journalism. And I spent a lot of time in the club. Like, you know, you guys probably don't know this, but there was a time where hip hop artists could never fill a large arena. Like they, you would, you needed to go write about an artist that was performing. They went on at three in the morning, <laughs> you know, in a grimy club. It always kills me now, like if I'm in the green room for some artists and you know, chicks come down in six inch heels and skirts up to here. We would have never worn that back in the day. You wore Tim's and shit you could run in. And like, it was like grimy, <laughs> you know, it was grimy like that. But one of the things I was really clear of very early on, I used to write for places like Spin. So this is not just hip hop. I'm, I'm talking about the Village Voice. I'm talking about, you know, uh, white mainstream music publications. That there was nothing sadder to me than the 40 something year old journalists at the club. I would look at that person and go, I am never going to be that. So I was planning a strategic exit out of that since 30. Part of my planning the strategic exit was to write something like Chicken Heads because I feel like the best work on hip hop feminism comes from people who are living the experience with their finger of the pulse of the culture at that time. I think that they can articulate a reality that I was really aware of that I had no business trying to articulate for them at 50. I don't want to be in nobody's club at 50. There was a party yesterday. I was like, I'm hungry. And by midnight, I really want to be home in my bed. I was no longer at the point of life where um, at midnight, I'm thinking about going out. Like, that doesn't happen anymore. So I, I just feel like this is not just true in hip hop. I feel like this is true in many forms of scholarship, that part of your maturity as an intellect, part of your generosity and growth as, a, uh, as um, a thinker and a scholar is to train and nurture those underneath you and then step out of the way. You know what I mean? And then use their work um, to help you continue to bring relevance to the work that you want to do so you're not stuck and stayed. I, I usually try to tweet during these things. I didn't tweet at all during like Mark and um, Treva's presentation because I kind of felt like Treva generally, and this is a woman I lecture with, at this point we've lectured internationally together. Like we've lectured together a lot. I know Treva's work that in the second that I'm down there tweeting, she's so uh, layered that I'm gonna miss a critical connection. So her work is not something that I can tweet during. But I'm also humble enough and respect her work enough to know that I might miss something really critical that can add to my own thinking in there. I just think it's our job to move out the way. I don't really have any interest in being a gatekeeper. I don't work in a space where I feel like if I don't do it, if I don't say it, it can't be said. It is being said. It is being said well, not just by people who are being published, but it's being said in the blogosphere. It's being said, like, I watched 
you know, young people, these, these women's age who don't identify as feminists, who are having really sophisticated conversations around feminism. I watch my 14-year-old son do the same thing. And that's the joy that I take in these days. It's really not about this kind of neurosis that I don't do the work, that it just won't get done. I just fundamentally don't believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Um a couple of things. One is, you know, part of what you're talking about is labor. And, you know, at CFC, we're hip hop generation feminists. That's a real specific term. It means that hip hop is an analytic that matters to us, but it's not the primary way that we necessarily identify. So, you notice in the manifesto that I read, that we articulated a whole host of political and cultural concerns that shape what it meant to be a part of the hip hop generation. And I would say that most of the posts that we write, do work from that generational frame, even if we're not talking topically about hip hop, which was never what we promised to do in the first place, because frankly, that's not necessarily our interest. Um, but also, you know, my second book is on hip hop, that is in the works. Um, so I am still writing about hip hop, but I don't, I don't necessarily like the insinuation that that I owe that I owe it to the culture to do it, right? Um, what you know. What I think of, for me, what it means to be a hip hop generation feminist is that, that what I want to do is try to speak some truth to the power about these power dynamics and uh, sort of historical forces that have shaped my life. But, um, and, you know, and I'm committed sort of in the book to talking about all the ways that I think women are finding a place in hip hop. So they're not necessarily able to be MCs in the mainstream in a major way, but they are producing all kinds of literature and talking about sort of gritty urban narratives, right? Um, that, that have been pushed out of the mainstream. So I talk about that in the work. I talk about other ways that women are invoking hip hop aesthetics in the music. Um, and, I, you know, and I'm thinking about sort of other ways that hip hop gets invoked to help women make meaning of their lives. That's what that book is going to do. But, but the other thing at CFC is it's a labor of love. It's not a thing we get paid for, right? Uh, it's a thing that we do just sort of for free. Uh, and so we talk about the stuff that's sort of happening for us in that moment. Uh, and that's not always the latest rap song that we heard or whatever. Uh, the last thing that I'll say is, too, is that calling dudes out in hip hop, which is kind of what we, what we do write about hip hop, is a lot of what we do. I mean, Talib Kweli is still running around town uh, mad at me for some stuff that I said to him last week. <laughs> and, you know, he and I are going to have a beer summit at some point. I'm committed to this beer summit. <laughs> Still asking about it, but um, you know, but I'm not always sure that the but you know, but I think one of the things I'm saying to you too is that there's a certain level of emotional labor that goes into doing this kind of work mm -hmm. um, of the type of truth telling that we want to do. So two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when I was on with Ron Fest Kanye's, you know, that runs Kanye's Mama's Foundation, the Foundation or whatever, Donna's house, and he was being a jerk, a complete and total jerk about issues relevant to black women, um, you know, that's sort of stepping in the neck of dudes and being like, you need to respect us and you need to care about things that are happening to us. We at CFC are doing that work and we're taking a lot of hits from it, right? Um, and then we have to, and those are real hits where people are like, come, you know, so then he came for me on Twitter, right, and said, oh, you know, you're not down for the cause, you ain't really representing brothers and, you know, I'm down for everybody in the community and, you know, like, so most of them just, they, you know, to live wrote a whole post about the CFC and what we weren't doing and how it was contradicting my Christian value. But I'm just saying that these dudes trip. They trip <laughs> very hard. Um, and one, I have a day job that matters to me, so I can't really get gutter with it like they deserve. But also, um, you know, I have to protect my emotional health as well. And so this work of sort of calling out sexism and telling the truth, people like, you know, get off on the, oh, when you're reaching with that's not fun for me. That's not my dream, goal, and desire, right? I want there to be transformation. Um, and these folks make you pay real hard to do the work to get them to even sit and listen and think about whether they need to change something. And that means that we have to take care of ourselves. Um, and that, you know, and that means that we walk away a lot more than we perhaps used to when we first started. I, th I think just a, 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 another quick point about your question is one of the things I think about a lot in terms of how does the work uh, suffer if we're not doing it. Um, 
I think that one of the things since we, we've been talking a lot about in this conference about pedagogy, I think that people who teach cultural criticism, who use cultural criticism in, in, uh, in the classroom as the form of an analytic, have to be really, really, really diligent that you don't allow your students to lapse into like a kind of lazy critique and call it cultural criticism. I'm really not interested in, in reading anything about Beyonce by somebody that starts off going, I don't like her music, I don't watch her videos, but you want to talk to me about like her latest piece of work. That's just lazy. It's just lazy thinking. Looking at a music video by an artist and writing about it as if it's documentary means that you are not training your students well. An English professor would never allow their student to write about a novel as if it was a work of nonfiction. So there is a kind of laziness in the part of people who are doing cultural criticism, who are actually teaching students, that the students then take outside of the classroom. And what we get is like a big mess and not this like real critical space. And so what I, what I feel really comfortable in doing is calling that out <laughs> when, I, when I see it. And what I'm very dedicated to doing in the classroom is to make sure that my students don't do that. Like that's actually unacceptable. Is anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, Brittany.